say either. I say either, you say neither, and I say neither, either, either, and either, neither. Now let's call the whole thing off. Yes, you like potatoes. Famed for her I grace like and beauty, potatoes. Deborah Carr was one of the greatest actresses of her generation. Tomato, potato, potato, tomato, tomato. Let's call the whole thing off. But oh, Deborah Carr was one of the best loved British actresses of the late 40s, 50s. But then that might break my heart. There's no doubt about it that she had a wonderful presence on the screen. And there's no doubt about it that uh, she had a, a wider range than Hollywood thought. She always maintained a certain genteel characteristic in many of her roles. And I think it gave her certain quality on screen and on stage that was particularly good for playing roles of authority. After, laughter, after, after, let's call her she could play a nun, or she could play a, a governess, she could play a, a more kind of sexy romantic lead. Uh, she had great versatility, but there was always something quite um, striking about her. Let's call her she was regarded as a dedicated actress who stood for perfection, discipline, and elegance, something that is seen in her glittering career. Deborah Carr was born Deborah Trimmer on the 30th of September, 1921, in Glasgow, Scotland. Deborah Carr was born in Glasgow. Uh, her, name, her real name is Trimmer. And actually, I think she always felt she was a Scottish lady. Um, and certainly Hollywood always thought that she was a Scottish lady too, somebody not to be trifled with too much. Deborah Carr was kind of inescapably Scottish, I think, throughout her career. Not just her red hair and her pale skin, but a, a certain sense of who she was and how she did things had a kind of Scottish fierceness to it or stalwartness to it. But did she have any stronger feelings about her homeland? I don't think so, no, because um, quite soon after she had decided to become an actress and worked in England for some time, um, she had her eye on Hollywood, so I think her aspirations um, overcame any feelings of homesickness. Leaving Scotland at a young age, Carr grew up in the west country of England, where she studied dance at a drama school run by her aunt. It was here she found a love of the stage. She won a scholarship to Nanette de Valois' Sadler's Wells Ballet Group, with whom she made her stage debut aged just 17. She clearly had a yen for physical theatre. Um, and I think that that training certainly helped her as an actress. It gave her a certain classic style, a uh, way of walking. I mean, once you've been trained as a dancer, you never really lose that. She had a certain poise and calm about how she acted, a kind of gracefulness that she kind of took to films. If you think right through to The King and I, she wasn't a natural, you know, she wasn't a star of musicals per se, but she had a kind of uh, a dancer's feel about her. And there's something nice about that with actors. And I think her, her way of moving certainly did draw Hollywood towards her in the end. You know, certainly that era of Hollywood where it was about the star as much as it was about the subject. But she realized success would not come from her dancing, and so she concentrated on developing her acting skills. Because her contemporaries were Belle Gray and Margot Fontaine, people of that ilk, and I think she did have a strong sense of ambition, and she wanted to be better than she knew she could be as a dancer, so she turned to acting. Changing her name from Trimmer to Carr, in 1939, she had small parts in Shakespeare productions at the Open Air Theatre in Hyde Park. It was here she was spotted by film agent John Gidden, who signed her for a five-year contract. In 1940, she made her screen debut in Michael Powell's Contraband. However, most of her scenes ended up being cut. She was establishing her name, which led to roles in Penn of Pennsylvania and Hatter's Castle, opposite Robert Newton and James Mason. Deborah Carr was popular with the public from the moment she first appeared on screen. 
I think the reason that people liked her was because A, she was not threatening, B, she was very good looking. She began her career and she sort of shifted from dancing into, into acting and she was immediately very successful. I think it was very much, it was kind of a local success. It was, uh, it was English films and Scottish films, British films if you want. I think people took her to their hearts, certainly British audiences, um, because she was local, um, obviously she was very beautiful uh, and very elegant, but there was something um, accessible about her, uh, certainly at that stage. Women could relate to her and men could rather like her because she wasn't threatening sexually. She was extraordinarily beautiful. She was an aspirational figure. Um, you could, you know, you could like Deborah Carr. I think Deborah had a lot of charm on the screen. Um, and she was, she had a very nice voice. Uh, and I think, you know, was a hardworking actress and, and, and people liked her. The early 1940s, the war was on. I think we were looking for stars who were friendly and not kind of remote, who were much closer. And I think over the, the preceding first two or three years of her career, she became very successful. Mr. Candy? Miss Hunter? Yes. 1943 saw the first of Carr's film classics in Michael Powell's The Life and Death of Colonel Blimp. Go back. To England? Yes, I'm afraid, sir. Cheer up. England isn't as bad as all that, you know. That is what we both want to prove, isn't it, Mr. Candy? Yes, Miss Hunter. The first film in which she really proved her acting chops, um, and then some, was Powell and Pressburger's The Life and Death of Colonel Blimp. I suppose when she started, uh, Michael Powell and Emmerich Pressburger realised she was a very good actress, but an English lady kind of an actress. While she, you know, was a success early on, the films were probably far rather forgettable. And the great first step in her career, certainly as an actress, was to, to meet Michael Powell and Emmerich Pressburger and become part of that team for a little while. You like being the general's driver? Of course, who wouldn't? He's such an old darling. I could have done a handstand when he asked for me. You know, he chose me out of 700 girls, sir. Some odds, isn't it? 700 to one. Crying out loud, look at that light. He ought to be reported. The Life and Death of Colonel Blimp is, is a classic. It remains a classic. And given Powell's um, gift for the unusual, so we say, for the flamboyant, uh, she, she was very much kind of challenged to be something more than perhaps um, the standard role would suggest. She played three roles in it, and she brought a distinctive quality to each of them, which was quite remarkable for any actor at the time. I'm marrying you because I want to join the army and see the world. I'm marrying you because I love watching you play polo. She played uh, Roger Liversley's lovers. Over three generations, three different women, they're all quite different women, although they appear to be the same combination of the ideal woman and the flesh and blood woman. This is exactly the quality that Michael Powell fell in love with. And I think that it transmits itself very clearly on the screen. Gotta go in a minute. Why? Got a job on. Oh, you would have. The film <laughs> proved to be controversial. Prime Minister Winston Churchill thought it would ruin wartime morale and the British Army refused to cooperate with the filming. What, those trucks? My private army. Winston Churchill wasn't overly pleased with it, and he said it questioned the spirit because it, it suggested that, what well, Germans could be friendly for one thing, it suggested there was more to an enemy that meets the eye, it's about a meeting point. And historically, if you look back on it, it's a hugely intelligent viewpoint of war. Despite cutting her out of contraband, this time Michael Powell fell for the beautiful young Deborah, and the two had a love affair. I think she had great charm, and I think she got on very well with Michael Powell. Deborah Carr and uh, Michael Powell um, had a, a, an affair. Um, they were clearly professional uh, uh, companions as well as uh, personal companions, and I think they worked very well together. Hollywood was now beckoning. And despite Michael Powell's hopes for her to star in his next film, A Canterbury Tale, Deborah Carr accepted a contract with MGM. This ended their love affair. Powell was infuriated when she decided, instead of taking A Canterbury, a Canterbury Tale, that she would go off and, and seek her fortune in Hollywood while the offers were there. And, you know, he, he said to her that that's it. 
you know, you, you're with me or you're, you're against me, and, and that's no more. I think it shows that she was prepared to put her professional ambition above her any consideration of her love life or personal consideration. I think she really, really wanted what she, what she finally got, which was to become um, a great screen actress and have the work that she felt that she merited. There was no doubt about it. She was a firm favourite in England as a female star and actually in America too because Colonel Blimp uh, and most of Michael Powell films did pretty well in America as well. As World War II ended, Deborah Carr did an eight-week tour of theaters in Belgium, Holland, and France, starring in Patrick Hamilton's thriller, Gaslight. It was here that she met Battle of Britain pilot Anthony Bartley, and the two married. Sister Cloda, we may proceed with our plans at Mopu. It will be called St. Faith. St. Faith? And you have been appointed to take charge of St. Faith. I, Reverend Mother? You. The film that really brought her to international recognition was Black Narcissus. Thank you, Reverend Mother. She played the same woman, but in two aspects of her life. And first as the nun, um, of course, the uh, Mother Superior in the Himalayan uh, convent, um, but also in flashback, showing her as a young woman and the circumstances by which she decided to become a nun. Chloe, don't you sometimes itch to get away? No, I don't want to go away. I want to stay here like this for the rest of my life. It was a very interesting film, considering it was all shot in England, and yet, you know, the, the art direction, you know, really convinced you you were in India. A wonderful film, the best use of Technicolor ever at that time. Superbly shot, and uh, she was pretty good too. They are two quite di distinct performances again. She's quite capable of doing this. And I think that quite apart from the exotic nature of the film, and this was at the time quite a shocking movie, and was shot entirely in the studio, which was unheard of, I mean, to get that sort of uh, look. You know that isn't true. Why should we want to keep you here against your will? Because you're all jealous of me, especially you. At least wait till the morning. You can arguably say Black Narcissus is almost a horror film wait in the way it's, it's done. It's extreme. And these wonderful use of um, matte paintings um, to create sort of the Himalayas as a kind of almost a place in the head as much as, you know, in reality. If, it, if they'd actually filmed in the Himalayas, I think the effect would have been lessened. It's kind of ever so slightly fake for a reason. And you kind of these wonderful depths. And it's kind of, the whole environment is, is mad to begin with. And his use of color with lipstick and kind of violent tones uh, is, is classic pow, but it just creates a, a world unto itself. Even now, it's a tremendously exciting film. I mean, Powell pulls that together and does it with great sensitivity, but at no, no lack of eroticism. It's a very, very erotically charged movie. A remark of, of the side of, of Carr's career was the kind of severity she could create uh, on screen. You know, she played Nun twice, she played Governesses. She could be fearsome, and she could be kind of this really strong force, um, but yet have, um, and it's very much there in Black Narcissus, a kind of fragility. A kind of that she, you know, at what point will she crack? You can see her internal storm going on within the film. The film was a success, both in the UK and in America, winning Carr the New York Film Critics Award as Actress of the Year. MGM knew it was time she was launched in America, and she and her husband moved to Hollywood. Her British accent and graceful appearances won her many roles as a refined and proper English lady in big-budget outings such as King Solomon's Mines and Quo Vadis. She also won her first Oscar nomination in Edward, My Son. She'd made a couple of attempts to move into other areas before um, the one that really did it. 
um, from here to eternity um, by appearing in King Solomon's Mines, which was a great adventure romp with Stuart Granger. It's the first time she'd done a proper action movie. And then Quo Vadis, um, the great Roman epic, which at least showed that she could do other things. Now, people in Hollywood were a little puzzled about her. She plays a governess very well. She plays a nun very well. She plays a mother superior even better. But is she going to play a sexy lady? And so it was such a huge surprise when she went into that film with Burt Lancaster, From Here to Eternity. Looking for variation in her work, Carr asked MGM to let her freelance between projects, and on good faith, they allowed it. Her agent then persuaded Columbia head Harry Cohn to cast her as Karen Holmes in From Here to Eternity. I went over there today, looking for you. I had some business to attend to at Connie Owe. That was all right, wasn't it? Of course. I have no right to inquire into your actions. That was our agreement. And why bring it up? Because I wanted you to know I'm not as stupid as you maintain all women are. Now, just what does that mean? What are you accusing me of now? Of nothing. It's no longer any of my business how many women you go out with, is it? But I wish you could just be honest about it once. The first important Hollywood role um, was From Here to Eternity, which, which broke the mould in, in many respects because, A, it was a very sexual role, which we hadn't really got a much of from, from her at that point. Uh, she was an embittered military wife. It was a complicated world in which the, you know, the film plays. And, you know, she was up with Burt Lancaster, so it was a big deal. I could use a drink myself. Do you want to ask me in? The liquor's there, Sergeant, in the cabinet. Under the direction of the legendary Fred Zinnemann, Deborah Carr was mesmerizing as the desperate alcoholic nymphomaniac, and she would be nominated for an Academy Award once again. No, she won't. Thursday's a day off. You think of everything, don't you, Sergeant? I try. In my position, you have to. Are these really important? Yes, but not important to get signed today. Tomorrow's OK. Risque and daring and, and pursued an idea of marriage and of, of the war that uh, was quite distinctive. My husband's off somewhere and it's raining outside and we're both drinking now. You probably only got one thing wrong, the lady herself. The lady's not what she seems. She's a washout, if you know what I mean. And I'm sure you know what I mean. Are you going to cry? Not if I can help. I think Deborah Carr did break out of the way they thought of her in From Here to Eternity, especially because of the scene on the beach um, with Burt Lancaster, and they saw her as more as a woman with sex appeal as opposed to the always somewhat bland English Rose, which she wasn't. It's an interesting scene to watch now. It's still erotic, but one has to imagine the impact um, at the time. I mean, it was just extraordinary. I mean, people went crazy for it, you know. It stands up as one of the great romantic scenes, you know, committed to, to the screen. The iconic love scene with Burt Lancaster on the Hawaii beach has since been acknowledged by the American Film Institute recognizing it as one of the most romantic films of all time. It was a very romantic um, and sexually arousing scene. And so the, put the two together and you've got an absolute sort of humdinger, um, one that sort of people always talked about and they still talk about. I think these days it's kind of a little bit laughable by modern standards, but at the time the kind of the sexual metaphor is quite, you know, volatile, shall we say. The idea of surf and um, rolling around in the sand in, in broad daylight was, was something um, genuinely risque, genuinely sort of shattering of, of stereotypes. What? Deborah Carr doing this with Bert Lancaster. So they got a new view of her from then. I never knew 
knew it could be like this. Nobody ever kissed me the way you do. Nobody? There's still a scene that suggested more than it actually showed, but the combination of the rolling surf, the rolling bodies, they wanted to suggest something that gave the audience the impression that they were watching something that they weren't really. No. Can't you give me a rough estimate? Not without an adding machine. Do you have your adding machine with you? I forgot to bring it. <sighs> then I guess you won't find out, will you? I think Deborah proved on From Here to Eternity that she could be something quite different to what all the Hollywood moguls had thought of, that she could only play the English Rose, and she certainly succeeded. To that point, um, she was, you know, she was the abbess, she was the nun, she wasn't the, the sex part. And I think, again, she was the one pursuing not being caught up being this kind of rather starchy Scottish lead and, you know, that she could melt a few hearts. Glad you came. With success at the box office and with the critics, Carr could choose exactly what she wanted to do next. In 1956, she starred in one of her most famous films, The King and I. The Hollywood were not certain what to do with her, but uh, Yul Brynner insisted that she played the governess in The King and I, which was a huge success. And again, that was a ladylike role, which she did superbly well, there's no doubt about that. Sometimes I wonder if you know what you're really facing, an English woman alone in a country like Siam. Oh, it doesn't matter, Captain, I shall have work to do. And the king has promised me a house of my own. I'll have a place to bring up my boy as his father would have wished. I think that The King and I, which had been an enormous success on the stage and then and in the film because the music was good, and I think she was, you know, perfect casting for it. Hello, young lovers, whoever you are. It wasn't her full range, but it was enough to make Hollywood think, here is undoubtedly a big star, not a Jane Russell or anything like that but somebody who was an actress and a beauty and someone whom the public liked. Love like you, be brave young lovers and follow your star. Be brave and faithful and true. But stages on her career, you, you kind of begin with the ballerina, then you go through Powell and Pressburger, and you go with Hollywood, and which kind of culminated at that stage with um, from here to eternity, and then you get to The King and I, which is beloved and, and much remembered, but arguably a step backwards. You know, she's playing a schoolmistress. You know, it's musical, it's, it's touching, it's a little bit silly, it's a little bit corny by today's standards. And, you know, it, it's a star vehicle. They're wonderful opposite one another. There's a terrific kind of spiky chemistry and flavor to it. It did it expand her, her talents particularly. Well, it showed she could move very well, and it showed she probably could have done a few musicals, but it didn't really as an actress, I don't think. Come. Both stars were nominated for Oscars for their roles. Yul Brenner would win the prize, and for the third time, Carr walked away empty-handed. Deborah Carr is one, I think, of only two actresses who have been nominated for Best Actress Oscar six times and never won. While she did get quite a few nominations, she did go quite awardless. And The King and I does mark one of the occasions where at least the Golden Globes gave her an award. I say to other people, what's your favourite Deborah Carr film? And many would say The King and I, because um, it's, it's such a sort of lovely sort of fable. But it's kind of, it's that Julie Andrews side of her rather than the, the sex pot side of her. Come, we'll do it again. The fact that she, you know, she has got an award to her, her credit at that stage is recognition by her peers that she is what she is, which is a remarkably good actress. And she can work in many, many different forms of film, from comedy, light comedy, to quite serious drama. She reprised her role as a nun, this time alongside Robert Mitchum in Heaven Knows Mr. Allison, which would give her a fourth Oscar nomination. 
Are there any Japs around? You're... You're an American. Heaven Knows Mr. Ellison was a lovely film by John Huston in which Deborah Carr plays a nun. Yes, I'm... I'm Sister Angela. And they have a kind of a romance which they never touch each other. But there was a kind of a <laughs> sexual, erotic thrust between the two. You had to be pretty subtle to yes. play those parts. Both of them had to be. And I think it was great credit to them that the film doesn't look over-sentimental or typically sort of Hollywood, we can't touch sex. The rice will be ready in a minute. Look, Mr. Allison, what I found in the rice sack. The two stars seemed to be polar opposites, but they soon found common ground and became close friends on and off the screen. That's a uh, sake. It's uh, kind of a Japanese drink. Oh, yes, sake. It, uh, it isn't, isn't that the wine made from rice? Well, it's kind of like wine, yeah, ma'am, only a little bit stronger. Robert Mitchum, who was known, I think, for bad behavior in those days, drinking and um, maybe drugs. But when he came on to Heaven Knows Mr. Allison and met Deborah, he sort of adored her and he had so much respect for her that he really behaved impeccably. Although it was very funny one night, he decided that everybody was going to smoke grass. But the grass that he decided we'd all have to smoke Deborah was certainly in the party, was literally the grass on the ground in Tobago. And everybody just fell about laughing because, of course, it wasn't grass, you know, that you smoked, even though he thought it must be because it was growing in the Caribbean. But she joined in with everything, and, and she was great fun. All right now, ma'am, together. Fun. Two, three, four. Of course, on the surface of it, they're complete opposites. You know, he's a big, brooding, slow, violent, dangerous guy, and she's a sort of English rose, slightly prim. Legend has it that Mitchum was very, was a little bit wary of working with her until they were filming in um, a boat, and she was throwing the paddles, and they broke, and. Um, she just let out, out a stream of oaths, which made him laugh so much he nearly drowned. Um, and that was it. That was a forging of a sort of, of a great friendship. Dead ahead. Easy now. Just Inside the prim and rather gorgeous um, Deborah Carr was a woman of real sexuality. You know, she was quite a gal. The thing about both of them is that on screen, and most of their characters, act as if they've got something to hide, that they've, they've got hiding another part of the personality inside them. Goodbye. Goodbye, Mr. Allison. No matter how many miles apart we are, or whether I ever get to see your face again, you will be my dear companion always. When he met Deborah, he behaved completely differently. She had a great sense of humor, but he had tremendous respect for her as an actress. And I think from that film, they stayed friends, you know, until he died. Just a moment. Carr was now at the peak of her career. The following year, she appeared in the screen version of Tea and Sympathy, as well as starring alongside Cary Grant in one of her best love films, An Affair to Remember. But we have some fast thinking to do. We've created a problem. Yes, I know. So let's not complicate it anymore. She was one of the biggest stars in Hollywood. However, at home, her marriage was suffering. Her husband, Anthony Bartley, was jealous of his wife's fame and financial success, as well as rumors of flings with some of her leading men. Filming also pulled her away from home and their two daughters, and they divorced in 1959. Well, there it is, Dal. Who linger? 
Just another town. Can't tell it from 20 others we've passed through in the last six months. The best part is when you come to them for the first time, like now. They're all different somehow. Carr had a great relationship with Robert Mitchum and would play opposite him three times in her career. In 1960, they did two films together, The Grass is Greener and The Sundowners, which would give her yet another Oscar nomination. He was a, a wonderful presence in the film, and he played again with Deborah Carr uh, and appeared as this, uh, the wife of this sheep farmer going across Australia. And so she did one of her best performances. You know we haven't said 10 words to each other all week? I know. What about going to town on Saturday night? You know, have a few drinks, talk. What do you say? Oh, I'd love it, Patty. But then most female stars did do their best performances against Mitchum because Mitchum actually helped them along without, without seeming to. He gave a lot to his partners in all these films. Once again, because he thought they were better than he was, probably. Why, why don't we call him Sundowner? Many felt Carr should have won that year but she lost out to Elizabeth Taylor's performance in Butterfield 8. I don't think Deborah Carr was worried about the competition from younger actresses. Um, she'd started very young and I think she was very realistic. She was pursuing roles that sort of shattered uh, her look and her type as Hollywood saw her. Um, she was looking for sweatier roles, not to be iguana. She was, um, she was looking for things that weren't standard romantic fare. In 1961, Carr made The Innocence, which was widely regarded as one of the best ghost stories ever made. You'd oh. never have found me if I hadn't pounced on you. Oh. Did I frighten you? Yes, a bit. Now you're my prisoner. Oh, Miles, let me go. Why? You're hurting me. Am I? Yes, Miles. Please let me go. Why? I told you, you're hurting me. Now, Miles, I mean it. Do you? Oh, you found it. I've missed it so. Mrs. Gross must have hidden it here. When the 60s hove to and she moved into, she was, of course, up against quite a lot of competition by then um, from younger actresses. She evolved into, quite well, into older parts. I particularly love her role in The Innocence, which is probably the best ghost film ever. The Innocence is a particular favourite of mine because it's a terrific uh, female lead performance uh, and a female-driven film. I thought someone was watching me. And who did you think it was? Why, Miss Giddens, you came out without your hat. So did you. She was better when she didn't have a leading man with her, almost that she could do much more with that kind of situation. It's a, The Innocence is a version of Turn of the Screw. Um, it's about a, a governess who goes to look after two children in a remote mansion, and it, two children claim to see ghosts. It's quite a simple setup in that respect. But again, it's all about the kind of the shattering of her poise, I think is what the kind of key to the film is. Um, how and when she will break down amidst this intense strain. Where is she? You know you can see her. Look, Flora, look. There. You know you can see her. I can't, I can't admit it. She's there. You know you can see her. That is the heart of the film, the, the skill in which she depicts her own fragmenting psyche. What is she seeing? Is it real? Is it not? As well as these two very strange children she's kind of confronted by. The film success it, it, it is almost entirely due to her reactions um, because, um, as it's a psychological drama, um, we're not entirely sure whether she is imagining these ghosts or whether they actually exist, so it depends on her reactions. And she is faultless in it. She's absolutely perfect. In fact, one of the most astonishing scenes in the whole film is when the young boy, who is possessed by the, apparently possessed by the spirit of the dead gardener, um, kisses her on the mouth, and it is clear from her very shocked reaction that it is an adult kiss, and it is a truly shocking moment. I'll put that alongside uh, Black Narcissus as, as one of her most 
enjoyable and striking roles. I think she, she kind of seemed to thrive in a slightly otherworldliness. Maybe it was the Scottish part of her again. It's kind of a, she's sort of the folkloric kind of world which she could have been embraced by really worked for her rather than the kind of more straightforward roles. As she grew older, her roles changed once again. She turned in fine performances in Tennessee Williams' The Night of the Iguana. It's just that I've noticed a certain animosity towards Mr. Shannon among the uh, ladies in his party, particularly in the case of <coughs> Miss Fellows. And I think with a soothing meal inside her, it might soothe her spirit. John Huston yeah. cast her in Night of the Iguana, which was a success, which also extended her range. I paint watercolours, and I'm a quick sketch artist. We travel together, and we pay our way as we go by my grandfather's recitations and by the sale of quick character sketches in charcoal and pastel. Well, the Night of the Iguana, where we all went to Puerto Vallarta and put that on the map, Deborah, of course, was playing the very, in well, she really technically wasn't English, but um, they came from New England um, in, in the play. And she was the daughter of the sort of 90-year-old um, would-be poet father. Who wouldn't like to atone for the sins of themselves and the world if it could be done in a hammock with ropes instead of on a cross with nails? She actually plays a, a relatively low-key role in that, but um, the fact is that she's up against quite a lot of um, strong actors, and she holds her own very, very well. <sighs> but she was still in high demand, and in 1967, aged 46, she became the oldest Bond girl. A Bond girl, age 46, must have been pretty beautiful and pretty well preserved to do that. The film was Casino Royale and it was uh, a great success. So once again, this prim, ladylike, beautiful lady whom Hollywood didn't know what to do with, a Bond girl at that age. So she clearly had a much bigger range than they ever suspected. Casino Royale, however, is not an official Bond movie. It's not the, the recent one, obviously. It's a rather deranged attempt to um, crack the surface of the Ian Fleming mythology uh, in a comic manner. So it, it had about uh, four or five different directors. It had Woody Allen, Orson Welles, David Niven. And it didn't have a whole lot of sense to go with those things. You watch it today as, as a kind of rather camp exercise in, in sort of Hollywood folly, as the kind of anti-Bond thing, and I suppose there's kind of a rather perverse pleasure to be had from it, but as a Bond film, it's a Farrago. Their union being thus bounteously blessed, a contract of marriage was entered into, which brought them at Tarry's, Blackloch, Bentorn, the Shugs are off, Glenough, and a good stretch of salmon water. It's amusing, and she is a good sport in it. I mean, she, you know, she, she knows how to um, play the game and take, take the mickey out of herself. But it's, it's not a very good film, and neither was um, Prudence and the Pill, for example, which she did, um, which is really best forgotten. So there's a, there's a handful of films after The Innocents, which um, I think show that she's probably in a position where she's, that her career is winding down. Under pressure from younger actresses, she agreed to appear nude in John Frankenheimer's The Gypsy Moths. She really didn't much care for the fact that actresses now had to sometimes appear nude. She did appear nude just once in uh, John Frankenheimer's The Gypsy Moths. Which is a John Frankenheimer film about skydivers, which doesn't have a lot going for it to begin with. Um, but it has her only nude sequence. She was rather kind of bullied into it, I think. And this was the time uh, where Easy Riders had come in and Hollywood was changing and growing to sort of much more of a kind of creatively daring world into which she probably didn't fit. I think she wanted to prove to herself as much as anything else that she still had it, that she, she, she did have a sexuality that, that people would respond to. Um, actually, it's not at all bad and weirdly enough, it doesn't, it doesn't do her any disfavour. Um, she comes out of it uh, with all her dignity intact. It worried her a bit 
and she decided that it was really better for her to appear in the theatre and uh, in early television. That's what she really wanted to do because she felt she was as much a classical actress as a film star. People forget her contribution to theatre, uh, which I think she enjoyed a lot, actually. I think it was an important part of herself. Uh, again, it probably goes back to training as a dancer and it probably fulfilled part of her, a physical part of her that needed to be expressed. One has to, you know, give her hats off for actually continuing and going back into theatre. Of course, by the time that she went back, she'd already built up this huge reputation. Everybody knew she was. She was a star. She was a movie star, and she was a British movie star. So um, the, home, the home team, the home audiences loved her. She was given an honorary BAFTA in 1991 and an honorary Academy Award in 1994. After a battle with Parkinson's, Deborah Carr died on October 16, 2007, aged 86. Shall we dance on a bright cloud of music? Shall we fly? Shall we dance? Shall we then say good night and mean goodbye? She was a very big star, but as sort of, and she was recognised. She got an OBE and a CBE from this country. Star has left the sky. Shall we still beat? Shall we then say good night? Deborah Carr was wonderful as an English lady. You got to look at her in Black Narcissus to see that she was a very, very shrewd and subtle actress. Be together with our arms around each other. I think that generally speaking, she just charmed people. She charmed people on the screen, she charmed people on the stage, and she charmed people in life. Shall we dance? Shall we dance? Shall we dance? Geordie Myth says Gateshead's iconic time bridge was the model for Australia's Sydney Harbour Bridge. True or not, it's certainly impressive and a great spot for Heat 5 of landscape artist, new tonight at 8.